I want you to open your Bibles with me today to Matthew chapter 7. As you know, we've been walking through these last few weeks to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. Last week, Charles walked us through the first part of Matthew chapter 7. Today, we're going to conclude this sermon, conclude this passage, conclude this, this study through this most important sermon that has ever been preached, a powerful sermon that Jesus gave. Now, what is always just a you know, quick like a reference point here for us to understand? Like whenever you hear a sermon preached here at Thomas Road, can somebody just yell out to me, what does the sermon always conclude with? Anybody? An invitation, that's right. It always ends with an invitation. It always ends with a, an opportunity to respond, an oppor opportunity to make a choice, to make a decision. Now, Jesus, obviously, who was the greatest preacher that has ever lived, he, in preaching this message, he did the exact same thing. And that's what we find in the last part of Matthew chapter 7 is an invitation. We don't find any new teaching. Now, all the way through, going all the way back to Matthew chapter 5, starting with the Beatitudes, like we have learned a lot of great things, great doctrine, great truths, great admonitions that Jesus gives, gives to each and every one of us on how to live. And so all through this passage, we've walked through like this, this learning experience of, of here's what we must do as followers of Jesus Christ. But now we come to this end part of the passage, this end part of the sermon. And what we find is this, is there's no new teaching here. There's not any new doctrines that are given. There's not any new statements that are, you know, laid out for us. There's no kind of inclinations that we need to kind of understand of like, hey, this is what you're supposed to do now. And this is how you're supposed to act. And, you know, you're supposed to be the light and the salt. You're not, and no more, you know, blessed are those who mourn. All like none of that stuff is found in the last part of this passage because this is the invitation. It's the decision point. It's the moment when Jesus is calling each and every one of us to make a choice, to make a decision that will change not only the day, but change every day. He's calling us to the place where we need to, to take what we've heard and actually decide, so what am I going to do with it? And so that is today what we're gonna be walking through in Matthew chapter seven, beginning with verse 13. And we're gonna start walking through this passage again about five different thoughts here that we just need to understand as we kind of clearly see as Jesus lays out this invitation. Now, he did it a little bit differently than maybe we do here. He, he didn't have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. He didn't have, you know, the music, uh, you know, start. He didn't have the piano player come up and start playing a song. He didn't have everyone stand and sing and open the aisles. And remember now, this sermon that he preached, it started with just a few people. He started preaching this message to, to just a few individuals, his disciples who gathered together. But as often was the case, whenever Jesus began to speak, like crowds began to gather. And so now what started with a few now was many, many people gathered in this place. And so as he begins this invitation, as he begins this declaration for the hearers of this sermon to make a decision, he starts with this idea in verse 13 of he lays out the most important choice that you will ever make. The most important choice. Look what it says in verse 13 of this passage. In verse 13, it says this, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, as Jesus is speaking to the group of people there that day, you can imagine that they're leaning in right now because this one that they had seen heal the sick and raise the dead, this one that they had heard him say these incredible things that, and we'll see in the last part of this passage, like they were astonished at what they were hearing. They were amazed at this, this idea of, of laying out all of these doctrines, all of these things of connecting the Old Testament to the New Testament, this, this idea that, that the Old Testament law is not something that he was putting down, that it's something that, that he had come to fulfill. And now he says this, that there are only two ways, two decisions, two choices that we can make and one leads to destruction and one leads to life. You can imagine now they're leaning in, right? Like they're leaning in. Let me give you just kind of a, a quick picture, a kind of an illustration of what that might have been like. So let's say that we, you know, there's like 4,000 people in this room. We're all seated, seated here. We're all gathered together. And let's say for some stupid reason, which we will never do, 
But let's say for some reason that on one Sunday, we decided to play a trick on all of you. And I told our staff before the service to go around and to lock every door in this room but one. Every door in this room but one. And I don't mean lock it from the outside so people can't come in. I mean lock it from the outside so you can't go out. And there's only one way out. That's it. And then let's say that for purposes of this illustration that I decided that I was going to come in and, and I was going to bring some wood in and some gasoline in. And, and while I was preaching, I was going to be running up and down the aisles, which by the way, would not be too far out of the you know, possibility, as you guys know, that I'll be running, running in and out of the aisles. I'll run upstairs and run through the aisles up there, pouring gasoline everywhere. And then I came down here to the front and I pulled out of my pocket a cigarette lighter, which by the way, I do not have because I don't smoke. But anyway, but let's say I pulled out a match or a lighter and I dropped it down and I started the fire. And I told you, there's only one door that you can get out of. What do you think would happen in that moment? I know what would happen in that moment. It would be chaos. I mean, you know, there would be some there people climbing over each other, knocking people down. There are people, you know, trampling people. Some of you who were smart would probably come up to me and say, hey, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you tell me what door it is. I mean, that kind of stuff would happen, right? Because everybody would want to get out. And there was only one door that was, you know, able for people to make their way out of that door to safety, to salvation. Only one door. That's kind of the picture that Jesus is laying out here. Like, hey, there's lots of ways that lead to destruction. Lots of ways that lead to, you know, to, to an end of life. But there's one. And it's a small door. It's a narrow door that leads to life. They're leaning in now. Like, they really want to hear, well, well, what does this mean? Like, what is Jesus trying to say as he lays out this most important choice that they would ever make? Now, understand... As Jesus is uttering these words, he's speaking to a generation of people at that time that were going through lots of different uh, types of thoughts. There were lots of pagan beliefs and pagan religions at that time. There were people who had idols that were in their home that they would worship. There were religious leaders who obviously were, and we're going to talk about those in a few moments, who were saying things that, that clearly were in conflict with this idea that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me, period. They had this idea, like, like there were lots of different things that were trying to attack this idea that there's just but one way, and that way is Jesus. There's just one way that leads to life. Now, here's what I would say to you. Here we are in 2023, and, and I would say to you that today, that there is more attack on the narrow way today than there was even when Jesus spoke these words. If you take the time to read the news and you see what is taking place in our world today, in our country today, sometimes even in our community today. We saw a couple of weeks ago when there was an after school Satan club that rented out the auditorium at Jefferson Forest High School for a movie night. Obviously, those statements, an after-school Satan club. Now, they interviewed the leaders of that club, and they said, oh, no, 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 We're, we just want to get people talking, and, you know, it's not the whole Satan stuff. Really? Because you call yourself the Satan club. You know, you don't have to run too far from that idea. I mean, we live in a world where, where Christianity is under attack. We live in a world today where common sense is under attack. The sexual revolution of the 60s and the 70s is nothing compared to the sexual revolution of today. And the sexual revolution of today is a totally different type of revolution because it's one that really turns everything upside down. It's a picture where we're seeing in schools, we're seeing even in our government and government leaders, this idea that God did not make them male and female, that God somehow messed up. And that God created people who were thinking in different ways and they actually were this when it maybe seemed like they were that and all of these different things. We are under attack today. The morals, the, the values that we think are just common sense are under attack and we today are in the minority. And here's what I would say to you. While we might be in the minority according to God's word, at least we are right of standing on the truth of God's word because God's truth that Jesus spoke 2,000 years ago did not cease to be truth. 
Because truth cannot change. You cannot morph it. You cannot decide, well, my truth is this and your truth is that. No, truth is truth, period. And so we live in a time today where there is an attack on truth. We live in a culture today. And listen, let's, let's not mince words here. Let's not be mistaken here. We know that we're marching towards a time when the things that I preach here on a Sunday, the things that we believe, the things that we read about in God's word that we hold dear, we know there will come a time when there will be frontal attacks against what we believe. That maybe even from the government itself that they will try to stop us from preaching truth. We know that that is the case. We know that that might happen sooner rather than later. And so when Jesus made this declaration, hey, there's a, there's a wide gate, there's a broad gate, and many people go to that gate, but that gate leads to destruction. What he's saying is this, hey, there's an easy way out. There's a way that people will run to because the crowd is running that way. There's a way that you can walk, that you can fit in with everybody else. There's a way that you can run that, that you won't stand out, that you won't be different, that people won't make fun of you. People will not criticize you. People will not put you down for what you believe. There is an easy way. And if you choose that way, if you run that way, hey, you're going to fit in. And life might be comfortable for a while, but make no mistake, Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Because God did not call us to find the easy way out. Jesus went on to say, but there's another way. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And that means this, that while it might be easy in this room to stand up and to preach the things that I preach, while it might be easy in this room for you to sit where you're seated today and to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him, while it might be easy in this room for you to hold dearly to what is truth and what is according to God's word, what is real. Like it might be easy here, but as you walk out of the doors and you go back to your neighborhoods, as you go back to your workplaces, as you go back to your schools, like it might get really tough. And so Jesus said, narrow is the way, difficult is the way. Why? Because everything is gonna press against you. Everything is gonna try to stop you from believing what you believe. Everything is going to try to get you off kilter. Everything is going to try to lead you away from what we know to be truth. And Jesus said, broad is the way. There's an easy way. But don't miss this. It leads to destruction. But there's another way, and it's tough. And it might get tougher. And you might get you know, people making fun of you. You might have people mocking you. You might have people attacking you. You might have people showing up trying to shut you down. You might have people showing up trying to get you to shut up and stop talking about this stuff. There is a tough way, but it's the only way that leads to life. So Jesus brings this sermon to a conclusion. And he brings it to a decision point of the most important choice that we can make. There's a broad way and there's a narrow way. And as he did this, he did this because he knew distractions are everywhere. Let's continue reading in verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 15. And he says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Now, he is not advocating here for a works-based salvation. In fact, he lays it out a little bit further. We'll get to in a moment where he makes it very clear. It's not a works-based thing at all. What he is saying here is that there's a result to what you believe. Like if you truly believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, if you truly believe that he's the only one that can save you, if you truly believe that he is the son of God who came to take away the sins of the world, that he died and that he was buried and that he rose again, that clearly if you believe that, if you've accepted that, then you're going to look different than everyone else. 
Because a bad tree cannot bear good fruit and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. By your fruit, you will be known. This is a result of our salvation. Now he says this, beware of false prophets, false teachers, false leaders, false messengers, false authors, false singers. Beware of false messages that come wrapped up in sheep's clothing. What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about this, is that there are people in that day and in this day who will try to say things that kind of line up with what God's word says. That there are people who will try to, to put a message together, put an idea together, a concept together that in some way pulls from the truth of God's word, but it nuances it and it crafts it and it shapes it and it gets it to a point where it looks a little bit like that, but yet the end result is something that is completely different. Now, Jesus uses a metaphor here. He uses some statements here that are pretty important because he said this, beware of those false people, those false prophets, those false teachers who are wrapped up in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Now, for those of you who have ever had the opportunity of going back into the days of watching, you know, the Bugs Bunny cartoons on Saturday morning, how many of you have done that, right? And you remember, right, the whole picture of, you know, Wile E. Coyote, you remember that story, right? And he was always the enemy, no matter what he wrapped himself up in, no matter what he tried to look like, right? He was always the one trying to come and to destroy the roadrunner. You get that picture, right? So that's kind of the picture what Jesus is giving here. Now, please do not misquote me and say that Jesus was quoting Bugs Bunny when he was using this passage, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. But what he's saying is this. Is it anyone who will take some truth from God's word and nuance it and wrap it up and put a bow on it and make it look pretty and make it sound almost really good and make it appealing to the people who are hearing it, but yet it is something that will lead them away from truth and belief that Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. That person might sound good, they might look good, they might have the best music, they might have the smoke in the room, they might have the best lighting, they may have the best sound, they may have the beautiful building that they're doing in this end, but if they are doing that, they are in sheep's clothing, but inside they are ravenous wolves. What are wolves always to the sheep? They are always the enemy. The sheep are always in danger whenever the wolves are around because they come to kill and they come to destroy and they come to attack. And we live in a time and a culture today where even people who will try to make it look like and sound like that they know what they're talking about according to the Bible and according to truth and according to God's word. And inside they are nothing more than ravenous wolves and they are coming on the attack to keep people away from truth. And that truth is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's happening everywhere. It's happening in churches it's happening in seminars and conferences. It's happening in books. It's happening in a culture where we're, we're nuancing truth and we're changing things to make it a little bit more appealing, a little bit more acceptable. And every time that we do that, every time that we try to take God's word and we put a different bow on it to move it away a little bit better so it's a little bit more, you know, kind of mainstream, every time we do that, we are acting as wolves who are attacking the sheep. Remember, truth is truth is truth, period. You got it? And so he understood that we've got the most important choice. Why? Because distractions are everywhere. And he goes on in this next part of the passage, and he wants to help people to understand that they better make sure which choice they are deciding, which one they are choosing. So let's go back to the passage in verse 21. In verse 21, it simply says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus here made a very clear declaration against a works-based salvation. He said, you know what? You might have done all the right stuff. You might have been sitting on the third row of Thomas Road Baptist Church every Sunday. You might have walked in with a Bible in your hand. You might have known the words to every worship song that was sung. 
You might have followed along and taken notes in every sermon. You might have served over in the nursery. You might have worked in the middle school department. You might have volunteered on the, on the special outreach days. You, you might have, have been a part of like the missions trips that went out. You, you might have done all that stuff. You might have even been standing right here at the altar on a Sunday. And when someone came down and said, I want to meet Jesus, you might have been the one to actually help them understand what God's word says. But if you've never come to the place where you in your own heart and in your own life have made the decision and the declaration that I believe that Jesus is God's son and that he died and that he rose again and he's the only way to heaven, he's the only way to salvation. If you've never done that, all of the great things that you have done are for naught. They mean nothing because it is through Christ and Christ alone. Everyone in this room, those of you who have your Bibles with you, those who have your phones open to the Bible, you ought to underline or highlight or circle or something. That passage that I just read in that statement, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, because you want to make sure, you want to make sure that this statement in Scripture that Jesus spoke is never to be spoken of you. That you want to make sure to be sure that you're sure that you're sure that one day when you die or when the rapture takes place, that when you step into the presence of God and when you say, Lord, Lord, that you do not hear the words, I don't know you. How do we do that? Through believing in him. So we gotta make sure Jesus wanted to make sure that every person, regardless of what they've done, regardless of how good they've been, how smart they've been, how hard they've worked. No, it's all about Jesus. And why do we need to be so sure? Why? Because the wrong choice has terrible consequences. The wrong choice does not end up well. Look what it says in verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But verse 26, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Jesus, again, gives this metaphor, this picture of the decision that we must make, the choices we must make. And again, he lays out two different choices here. Everything here is two choices, right? And the one choice is you can build a house. And if you build the house on the rock, if you build it on the foundation of truth, on the foundation of God's word, and you build it in the right place and you build upon it the lifelong journey of building your life on the truth of God and Christ and who he is and the word of God, that you're going to be like a rock, like built on a rock. And no matter what comes against you, which it will, by the way, life is tough. That no matter how many attacks that you face, no matter how many storms you go through, no matter how bad it might get, you will not fall because you're built on the solid ground of Christ. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. You've heard that hymn. Then he gives a picture of another, of a person who might build a beautiful home, a beautiful house, a beautiful castle. And they work hard and they do all the right stuff and they're doing it the right way and And yet when they build this beautiful castle that that is there to impress everybody who sees it, they've built it on the wrong foundation. That when the winds come and the rains come, it gets taken down, it gets destroyed because they did not build the house correctly. I'll give you three illustrations of that truth. Back in 27 AD, there was a, a Roman guy who was a very wealthy guy in Rome, and his name was Attilius, and he decided to build a big Colosseum. As you know, back in those days, the Colosseum was a place where all of the city would come, and, and they would come to watch the gladiators fight. And, and I mean, it was like the, all the entertainment. It was like the Super Bowl of the day. And so he decided to build himself a Colosseum, and he built a Colosseum that seated 50,000 people. And he did not want to wait because he was older in years. He did not want to build it the right way. He didn't want to take time to build it. He got the guys in there and said, hey, build this quickly. And rather than put stone in there, let's put some wood in there. Let's build it up this way. I want it to see 50,000. And he took all the shortcuts because he wanted to get it done as quickly as possible because he wanted to be able to walk into his Colosseum with 50,000 people there so he could celebrate what he had accomplished. And the very first time that that Colosseum opened, 
50,000 people showed up to watch the gladiators fight. And when they walked into that with the weight of the people surrounding that Colosseum, one entire section collapsed and 20,000 people died that day because he didn't build it correctly. And this, by the way, was just a few years in connection to when Jesus spoke these very words. There might even be a reference point there of like, oh yeah, I remember that. And in fact, it was from that in Rome that they actually began from there on, Rome decided they would never let people build Colosseums again unless they built it according to safety standards. And that's the beginning of what we kind of know as a building code. I'll give you a second example. 2005, some developers in South Padre Island, uh, Texas, decided to build a beautiful tower, a 31-story tower on the beach there, looking out over the ocean. It was going to have the most spectacular views that they could possibly imagine. In fact, this is what they wanted that to look like, a beautiful tower that looked out over the ocean where people could come and buy those condos and sell them for millions of dollars each. And this would be a, a destination place in South Padre Island. And they were building this building. This is what it was supposed to look like. But in around 2007, 2008, they started to see some problems because that building began to actually sink a little bit. And one section of that building actually sank about 14 to 15 feet. And they started figuring out how can we change this? What can we do? You can see the construction there. Like, like how can we change the, the construction here? Can we shore it up? Can we fix it? Can we make it happen? And in late 2008, the developers had to send out a letter to all the people who put down millions of dollars to buy condos in that facility to say we regretfully announce that we cannot salvage this building because the foundation is not right. And so what that building was supposed to be, what it became, it ended up like this. Nothing but a pile of rubble. And in 2009, they, in a, a controlled implosion, they destroyed that building and today it doesn't exist because they built it on the wrong foundation. Those developers, they borrowed $75 million to construct that building and they lost it all. So you see the picture of what Jesus was saying. Hey, if you build your life on the right things, if you stand on truth, if you believe that God is who he said he is. If you believe that, that Jesus is the son of God, that he died, that he rose again, that he and he alone is our salvation, that he is the only one that can save you. If you believe those things, if you stand on the word of God, then it's like you're building your house on a, a solid foundation and it will not fall. But, but if not, it's going to be like it's built on sand and it will come crumbling down. Remember verse 13? Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. So Jesus lays out this powerful choice, this amazing declaration, this statement. As he's speaking to the group that gathered there, he basically says, guys, there's only one way. There's only one way. Now, I've told you two, but, but one of them doesn't end up well. The only real way is to get past your desire to be someone, to get past your desire to be noticed, to get past your desire to have people look at you and celebrate you and to recognize that Jesus is the only way. Matthew, in recording the sermon, it's interesting that after Jesus made this declaration, after he gave his invitation, Matthew records the, 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 the final statements here. He kind of gives a picture, a, a statement of like what this sermon ended like. And look what it says in verse 28 and 29. It says, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and as, not as the scribes. In other words, what Matthew said is, hey, when Jesus spoke, people recognized it's different. It's not like what we've always heard. It's not like what we always assumed. It's not what the religious leaders told us. And so today we sit here in this room and I've got to be honest with you. Jesus made the statement here in this passage we read a moment ago 
that there's going to be a day when every single one of us in this room step into the presence of God. And my guess is that everyone in this room, that when you step into that moment, that you're going to step into that moment with the assumption that everything is right between you and God. Now, I know there may be someone here today who's walked in here as a doubter, someone who's walked in here as a skeptic, who, who, who just knows, like, I, I don't believe this. I get that. But for the majority of the people in this room, like, we all assume that when we step before God, everything is going to be good. Can I take you back again to what Jesus said? Because what Jesus said is one day, they will step before me and they will say, Lord, Lord, did I not go to church in your name? Did I not serve in the nursery in your name? Did I not sing all of those songs in your name? Wasn't my Spotify playlist all worship songs? Like, like, didn't I do all the things that I was supposed to? Didn't I go to the ladies' Bible study? Man, didn't I, didn't I read all the books that I was supposed to read? Like, like didn't I do everything right? And Jesus will look and say, I'm sorry, but I don't know you. So for those of you who were paying attention a few moments ago, remember when we were talking about the foundations and I said, I'm going to give you three examples. How many of you noticed that I only gave two? Lots of hands. Here's why I only gave two. Because the third example might be you that you might be building your life based on all the things that you think are right. That maybe you think everything is right between you and God. You've worked hard, you've served hard, you've given, you've sung, you've read, maybe even you've spoken. But at the end of the day, you don't have clarity. Maybe there's moments of doubt. There's moments where you sit back and think, I'm not really sure I think it's good, but boy, I sure wish I could know. Romans chapter five tells us that God demonstrates his own love towards you, that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Romans six tells you that what you deserve is separation from God for eternity, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 10 says that if you believe that Jesus is God's son, that he died and that he rose again, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. As we come to the end of Jesus' sermon, as we come to his invitation, not mine, I want to make absolutely sure that every person who is seated in this room can walk out of this room today without doubt, without concern, without worry, that you can walk out of here knowing that you know, that you know, that you know, that if you walk out of here today and you get in your car and you drive out of this parking lot, and as you're driving down 460 or 29 or Ward's Road or wherever it is that you might be going when you leave here, and let's say that in some weird turn of events that there's a, an accident that takes place and sadly, your car is involved. And let's say that sadly that you do not survive that crash. And that you immediately are standing before God. Man, I want to make sure. Oh, I want to make sure. And I pray that you do. That when you look into the face of Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, which we will all do. That we will just simply hear one word. Welcome, because that's the word that matters. With our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. I don't want anyone moving around unless you're coming to the front, unless you're coming to serve. This is a serious moment because I believe with all of my heart that there are some, maybe many in this room today that maybe you think you've been doing it right Maybe you think you've been checking all the boxes. You've been crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. You've been doing everything that you know 
that you need to do. But at the end of the day, if this were the last day that you spent on this earth, which let's be honest, it very well could be that you don't know for sure. You've worked hard to get there, but you're not sure. Man, I want to make sure. And so in a moment, as our team is gathering here at the front, I want you to set aside every bit of distraction. I want you to set aside every worry of what people might think. I want you to set aside every thought that might be running through your mind right now of like, man, rationalize them. Man, I don't need to do this. I don't need to make sure. I, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I want you to set all of that aside because we're not promised tomorrow. Today might be the last day we spend on this earth. And as your pastor, as the person who gets the, the privilege and opportunity of opening this sermon that Jesus preached and sharing it with you today, like not only do I take it an obligation, I, like I take it as a privilege to make sure that not one person who hears my voice right now has any doubts whatsoever. And so in a moment, Charles is going to sing. And when he does, I don't want there to be a hesitation. I don't want there to be a moment of wondering. I don't want there to be a, a thought that runs through your mind that could keep you from making a decision. Because this right here, as Jesus said, and again, these are Jesus' words, not mine. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Life might be easy and not making a move. And it might be difficult to own the position that you're in and to recognize, yeah, I, I need to make sure. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow the way that leads to life. Today, if you're here and you don't know 1,000%, like absolutely sure, if you were 1% unsure, you were 100% unsure. Because Jesus is not the author of confusion. And so right now, I'm going to pray a prayer. And again, I'm going to go back to the words that, that God's word gives to us. And as I pray this prayer, if you're here today, you don't know for sure that you absolutely would hear the word welcome as you walk into heaven. As I pray this prayer, I want you to silently pray this prayer with me, just from your heart to God's. I want you to get out of your own head. I want you to get away from the distractions, get away from all the stuff that you're thinking about. All the stuff you're worried about right now, I promise you, we'll be here 10 minutes from now too. Get out of your head. And I want you to pray this prayer with me from your heart to God's, asking him to save you in this moment. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I've heard your word today. I heard what Jesus said, that it's not about works, it's not about being good. It's all about what Jesus did. Today, I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died. And I believe he rose again. I believe he died for my sins. I believe he's the only one that can save me. I believe he's your son. I want to be sure, God. I want to know. So today, forgive me of my sins. Save me today through your son, Jesus. And help me to live for you for the rest of my life. As you give me the power to do it. And thank you, God, that one day when I get to heaven, because of Jesus, you will welcome me home. Thank you, God, for saving me. With every head bowed and with every eye closed, if you just prayed that prayer in this room and you meant it from your heart to God's with no one looking around, 
I want you to take a bold move and I want you to just hold your hand up right now in this room. I want to see your hand. Wherever you are in this room, I just want you to hold your hand up right now. I want you to keep that hand raised because I'm going to ask you to do with your hand raised, keep it raised. I see hands all over this room. What a beautiful picture with that hand raised. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Remember what I said a moment ago. Jesus said it broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow the way that leads to life. It's awesome to see what God has done, but, but now understand everything in this world is going to keep you Try to keep you from actually taking the next step. But God has called us clearly, take the step. And so if you prayed that prayer, I want you to not worry about what anyone thinks. I want you to not worry about what might happen. I want you, if you are raising your hand right now and you prayed that prayer, I want you to stand up right now where you're in this room. Take a bold step, bold step, bold step. Stand up. If you're raising your hand, stand up right now where you are in this room. Stand up. Go ahead and stand up right now wherever you are in this room. Man, what a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture. And here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. And by the way, if you're sitting here wondering, like, wonder what people are thinking, I promise you this. Every person seated in this room right now is rejoicing because of the decision that you're making in this moment right now. Every single one of them are rejoicing. And here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. If you're standing right now, You'll see all these men and women that are here at the front. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to step out and I want you to come down here right now. Just come to the front. Wherever you are, just come to the front right now. Come to the front right now. Take a step, come down. If you're seated, man, let's cheer them on. Let's cheer them on. I want you to come down to the front. If you're in the balcony, come down to the front. Just make your way down to the front. Come right down. Wherever you are, make your way down. Come on down. Come on down. There's some from the balcony. They're coming all the way from the back row. That's awesome. Come on down. Just come on down right here. Come on down. Yeah, come on. Cheer them on. This is awesome. This is great. This is amazing. Come on down. Now, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. If you're here at the front, I want, I want all of you who came down, I want you to look at me just right mo- this moment, okay? The decision that you've just made in this moment is a decision that changes not today. It does, but it changes eternity. Because again, the same Bible that I preach today from God's word tells us this, hell is a very real place where we will spend a very real eternity. And the only sin that will cause you to go to hell is rejecting Christ. Today, let me tell you what you've done. If you meant it from your heart to God's, today what you have made the declaration is, I no longer reject Christ, I accept him. And today, hell is not in your future. Hell is not something you will have to deal with. Hell is is something that you can forget about from here on out because today you get to celebrate heaven. A place where Revelation 21 talks about a place where there's no more sorrow and no more sin and no more tears and no more pain. And listen to me, and no more death. Eternity in the presence of God, which is awesome. And that's what God has done for you today. And so right now, I want to pray for you. And after I pray for you, all of this team that are gathered here, they're going to take a moment, just talk with you and just kind of celebrate with you. Okay. And and then when, and then this church, we're going to rejoice of what God has done here today. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for who you are. God, we are overwhelmed. We are amazed. We are shocked. We are blown away. We don't get it. How much you could love us, how you could do what you've done how you could send your only son, Jesus, to die for us and he could rise again and and that through believing in him that we could step out of our sin and that we could be made saints because of Christ. God, we celebrate. I thank you for every one of those who've walked down this aisle. What a gift, what an amazing declaration they've made today. God, I pray that you'll be with them, strengthen them, grow them, lead them, guide them. Lord, help them to see and to know that you today are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords from this day and for all eternity. And we celebrate with them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Guys, if you would, team, would you talk with those who've come forward? Hey, can we celebrate what God has done here today? Can we celebrate? Charles, take us out.
God is good all the time. God is good. God bless you. Come back tonight and let's, let's celebrate what God did today. Let's celebrate tonight and worship in the great hymns of the faith. We'll see you back tonight. God bless you and have a great day. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We're so glad you joined us. If you prayed to receive Christ today, we'd love to hear from you. We want to help you as you begin this new journey of faith in Jesus Christ. Send an email to the address on the screen, pastor at trbc.org. Likewise, if you've never accepted God's free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus, but you'd like to know more, we're here to help you. Just reach out to us and we'd love to tell you more. Our mission at Thomas Road is to change our world by developing Christ followers who love God and love people. If you'd like to help us fulfill that mission by giving to our ministry, go to the link on your screen and make your contribution today. Help us help others with the life-changing truth of God's love.